Good morning, good morning everybody. Thank you so much to connect to this uh, wonderful session. And I would like also to welcome all the people that are here in this National Health Institute Car Carlos III, the National School of Public Health, that welcome you. And uh, thanks also to bring us the rain, this wonderful weather that we need so much. Thank you so much. I think you are going to enjoy a lot uh, this uh, beautiful city and we are here to celebrate the 25 years of the Observatory of Health Systems. We are very proud that 55 years ago, here in this same institute, the observatory was born. This 25 years has been very, very productive as we are going to see during uh, this session. Uh, I would like also to thank the Institute of Health Carlos III to bring us the possibility to stay here. Uh, the director of the Institute, uh, Cristobal Velda, was very sorry to cannot uh, stay with us, but uh, he is very proud uh, that you choose to celebrate your 25 years here in this uh, public health institute, institution. Uh, I think uh, today we are going to talk about uh, a, a, a thing that is very important for all of us. All of the citizens as uh, health is a worry, is the main worry of the whole population. And after the very strong years, very hard years of the crisis, economical crisis plus the pandemic, I think we need to rethink and think about how we come to build these uh, national health services that we need so much. That's the reason we are here to discuss and to have uh, the opportunity to interchange the best opportunities, the best experiences of the different countries. I think we European countries as a community of countries that share many values, but of course many different experiences with our experience, our our way to do the different things can learn a lot about the, the best experience. Then, thank you so much uh, to stay here with us. Uh, we will have uh, enough time to share and to discuss uh, many important things. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pilar. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies, it's a special pleasure and honor for me to welcome you all, our partners and other colleagues attending here in Madrid, as well as participants attending over the web to this important event. A very special year for the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies has started. As Pilar just said, the organization turns 25. We can all think back what our lives were like when we were 25. It's quite a while. More than an opportunity to look back, it gives us an even stronger incentive and some special opportunities, including this event, to promote evidence-informed health policy making and learning from each other in the context of today's rapidly changing societal realities. The 25th anniversary of the observatory is being marked through a variety of activities, events and materials that are branded in celebration of the Jubilee. To be honest, we have not been particularly keen to market ourselves or to make big headlines of the partnerships outputs, which are public goods or their impact. However, in the present situation of multiple and overlapping crises, we wish to increase awareness of the power of evidence and learning from each other, our partners, as well as member states and beyond and to do everything we can to enhance resilience of our societies. We know that health systems are one of the cornerstones of societal resilience, and the observatory's mission is to continue working with existing partners, users, partners, networks, and new stakeholders. I would emphasize new stakeholders to support professionals, managers, and policymakers for the very best of our populations. And with these words, I wish you all welcome and thank 
the Spanish Ministry of Health and this institute for organizing this important event. Over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, both Lisa Maria and Pilar. Thank you for welcoming us here. Thank you, Lisa Maria, for chairing us for a number of years, not 25, but for a number of years. Welcome to colleagues here in the room and welcome to colleagues online. We have a very uh, tight program today, very busy program, but I assure you and our colleague moderators, uh, Susie and Matthias, will make sure we'll stick to the time. So there is, is at least uh, 20, 25 minutes in each one of the two sessions for debate. So please, for those online, you have already a chat function to, to bring uh, questions. Matthias will be summarizing and bringing your questions to the room here. And for those here live, we'll, have, we'll circulate with a microphone. What I wanted to do now is just uh, the briefest of introduction, an appetizer, a bit to get the, the words there, you know, the kind of the words, the, the, the concepts, the kinds of strategies. We acknowledge, and we are aware of that, that is a very broad topic that we're talking about today, but I think we can manage, we will manage to focus on the most important key priorities in strengthening resilience of the health systems. And it's very important, we want to look forward. We want to hear about COVID, but we want to go beyond COVID. It's, uh, COVID is just one of the shocks that we have had, but there are many others coming, unfortunately, and many challenges. So let me give you a bit of a sense of the, uh, this kind of field. First, of course, sorry, it's a bit about ourselves, a tiny bit. Uh, we're talking about the, the, the work of the observatory in this field. We're really proud that uh, since day one, we started doing work in the field of resilience. Actually, I'm, I'm glad to say you cannot see them, but just a sense. Uh, we started with that volume that did a detailed analysis of experience with COVID and towards looking towards the future, what's been called building back better. Huh? And then we did a number of work for several presidencies. We'll hear later about the Belgian presidency, which we have the honor to be working to support them with evidence on looking at the resilience of systems and the role of the European Health Union. We don't work, actually, uh, one of the first briefs in 2017 on the subject of resilience was written by ourselves. In 17, we talked about the concept of resilience well before COVID was there. And our country profiles that we are doing uh, for the European Health Union, with the European Health Union and with the OECD, we already had a dimension measuring resilience also since 2017. We didn't expect COVID though, I must say. So that's some of the work we've been doing, looking at uh, addressing backlogs. We've been looking at the European support, as I said already, for resilience. We have a special health policy issue. The editor is here today, Reinha Busse, looking at some of the evidence on COVID and resilience. So please, if you have a minute, if you have time, take a look at all the evidence we've been doing in this field. And as I said, I really want us to look at the future. I told you, this is not a detailed analysis and presentation, but just raising some of the kinds of strategies that we've been collecting to strengthen the resilience of the health system, which is what you're going to hear now in a, in a minute from the horse's mouth. The policy makers, the member states, and the priorities are taking now to strengthen the resilience of the system. And I just want to introduce some of those. Clearly, of the uh, 20 strategies we looked at, nine of them, as you can see here, were in the area of governance, leadership, monitoring, uh, coordinating our different levels of government. Interestingly, it's one of the key issues we learned uh, during COVID. That is less whether, is one of the questions I heard the most in my job recently is, is it better those countries that are centralized or these countries are decentralized? And we are in Spain, a country where that debate pillar took a lot, a lot of uh, preponderance. And what we said, it depends. It's easy, right, to say that. It depends. It depends how well you divide those jobs, how much transparency, how much communication, how much coordination, and to ensure, and to ensure that uh, the politics, the politicians are, need not use the COVID as a way to uh, disagree with each other uh, as it happened. So coordination, transparency, uh, involving, we know about that, there's no rocket science, involving the population, involving the, the health workforce is fundamental, but we realize, we learn how those countries who did that were far more successful in implementation and in compliance. 
This is the area that doesn't let us sleep, right, Pilar? Policymakers, Lisa Maria, that's the area that keeps us awake. I don't want to influence your voting. You're going to vote in a minute. But this is the area that worries us the most. From the attracting new professionals to the, to the health workforce, it's becoming a big issue, to issues of reskilling and repurposing, it may be one of the ways to address. It is one of the ways, and the observatory, I had Matthias here, Matthias Wiesmer is doing a lot of work on skill mix, on different uh, roles, uh, uh, task shifting, reskilling, uh, the using of digital technologies. And third, of course, is not just about attracting, it's about retaining the health workforce, it's about protecting the health workforce, it's about supporting the health workforce. Health workforce are asking us for more flexibility. They're asking us for much more support in the area. For instance, nurseries. There was a study the other day talking about in the NHS, Martin McKee, if they had nurseries in the hospitals, it would make a huge difference for the well-being of the professionals there, for their, their performance and so on. No rocket science. What's the cost of a nursery for a hospital? And imagine what it make a difference, right? And uh, later on, I see, I'm trying to start giving you, so you stick to your seminar. Those of you here cannot escape, those online, because I'm pointing out people like Vesna Petrich later on, who comes from the World Health Assembly. Uh, just now, we came from the World Health Assembly of WHO, and health workforce was at the very, very core of the debate with member states, and we'll hear more from Vesna Petrich later on. So clearly, one of the areas that actually are going to be taking for the ministerial conference in Tallinn with the WHO, uh, and uh, my colleagues here, many of you have been involved on that, uh, is going to particularly focus on the area of transforming delivery and implementing innovation. Interestingly, we know a fair amount about organizational innovations, about the role of primary health care. We know a fair amount about the impact of digital, but we have enormous problems on the transformation and the implementation of that evidence. So building and scaling up uh, primary health care, uh, we learn from Spain, we learn from many other countries that those countries that had effective primary health care dealt with the COVID crisis far, far better. It was not the beds, stupid, if I may say so. Those countries were arguing, we have more beds, therefore we deal better with COVID. No, what made the difference and probably Pilar will come out that, was primary health care centers that had e-health records, were monitoring the population, and they keep people at home when the hospital beds were not needed. And it's not just about COVID, as I said, this is about the strength in the system. Strength in integrated care is the usual suspects, I know. And interestingly, integrated care is not just normally, it can be done by having new patient care pathways, by having e-health records, by linking, regardless of the organizational mechanism you have by linking the different levels of care and by all having the same information and monitoring. Patients, uh, the co-production, an issue that Martin McKee, who's going to speak later, has been pushing very much for this Tallinn conference, very much this idea that innovation and reform will not take place unless there is this co-production at the bottom level, bottom up, between the health workforce and the patients. And uh, finally, it's not just about investing on digital health, it's about adopting digital health, it's about training digital health. We have this program in the observatory with EU money, with EU funds, where we are doing training. Uh, we are supporting the training of digital skills for the health workforce. And it's not just training of money, it's culture. We see some countries going backwards on the telemedicine and some of these developments. So there's a huge difference between the rhetoric and the reality. Now is the time to vote. Can you please all go in the room? Please, 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 please. I give you a minute and online to slide on. We really need these votes. This vote is going to be fundamental now for my colleague Susie Lesso to get taken over the next session. The next session is going to be on key priorities of member states, key priorities of member states to strengthen the resilience of the health system. Okay? So we're going to hear from the horse's mouth, as I said, what are member states doing? What are their main worries? towards the future. But I'm going to ask you, you here now and in, here in the room and online exactly these questions. Are people are already voting, uh, Jora? Excellent. Oh, yes. OK. Even the people in the room. Let, me try, let me try to influence you a bit. I don't like this democracy and you know that. So let me try to influence what's really important. You see, people vote without me influencing them. OK. 
Okay, okay, okay. So I have here a selection that I felt was important and it's going to be very difficult because it keeps moving, because it's moving according to the number of votes. Okay, in that selection that you all seen already, political leadership involving the health workforce, key to trust, part of that uh, Tallinn conference, Susie, trust, 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 it's going to be important, Martin, trust, 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 and part of that is good communication and involving the population, the health workforce, trust in our system. I see second in our ranking today is prioritizing health workforce. We tried very hard to get there high. Yes, great. Next, now in the ranking, I hope it doesn't change so I can continue, build and scale up on primary health care. Pilar, you must be happy. How many people have you bought to get that as a high priority? I know it's your baby. You've been working very hard. You've been leading primary health care in Spain for years. Well done, you. A strengthen, remember, remember, resilience is not healthcare. It's not health system. Resilience is as much as a social system, as much as economic system. And then again, health needs to work with other sectors. As we know, forever, those of us who have been working for a little while in the system. Access, vulnerable populations, important. Invest in digital health, we talked about that. And their implementation, achieving the right balance between central and decentralized decision making, an issue in federal countries is fundamental. But what can we do? Some people say there's no money. That's the bottleneck. There's no money. Nothing we can do. Is that true? Capacity to transform, implement organizational innovation, achieving the right balance. I said already this one. And my vote is not included there. I'm very happy that I most got most of you. It's you who voted against it. Oh, there's an 11% that said I didn't guess well. I'm sure there should be more than 11%. Okay, so that's uh, the appetizer. I'm sorry it went very fast, but I hope it starts getting our mental juices going. And I'm going to introduce my deputy, Susie Lesov, who's now going to um, take over on the next... No, that's not the one I want to show. Now I want to back to the slides, and we'll put the slide of this session. Exactly, you guys are doing a great job. Thank you very much. Your session is yours. I would like the microphone. As well. Yeah. <laughs> you want clicker, thank you. Hi. I'm going to be very quick because I know we're running a tiny bit behind despite Giuseppe's promises. And I'm going to ask the next round of speakers if they'd come and join us and sit with Pilar and with Mar uh, Miss Maria. So Jose Ramon Repollo. I'm not going to introduce everybody properly, but from the National School of Public Health in Spain and, and from so many other settings in Spain, I think, oh, I think very familiar to everybody and a very much a person who does both academics and policy. And then I think we could like to have Jason Young, if you don't mind, Jason, joining us from Switzerland, from the Federal Ministry, and Hugh Alderwick, who's from the Health Foundation in the UK, and Sophie Lopez from CNAMS, which is the French Social Health Insurance Agency, and Patrick Urison, who is another of these academic policy people. Um, these are all partners of the observatory, but also all people working at the interface between what evidence says and what the practice does. So, sorry, I'm very, oh, now I can hear me. So these are all partners of the observatory and all people who really understand this policy evidence interface and, and, and have been through lots of challenges with resilience. If we could start with strengthening health systems resilience and the priorities with a really kind of more detailed example from Spain and from the Spanish National Health Service response. So. Jose Ramon, if I could give the floor to you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me give the welcome to the National School of Public Health. Next year, we will have the 100 years anniversary. Therefore, we are leading the old fashioned way of uh, training in public health, in, not only in Spain. Well, um, let us go to the point. The combined effect of the economic crisis and the COVID pandemic can be summarized in three ideas. First, the response of the Spanish NHS to the crisis have shown its strengths and merits, but also have revealed its weaknesses and dysfunction. Faces with the consequences of the Great Recession and the pandemic, our national health system has shown its resilience and provided a precious contribution to preserve the health and well-being of Spanish citizens. But today fractures appear that put its sustainability at risk and that require a treble therapy. Good governance, 
resources and reforms. In this way, uh, the process of response to the crisis, we can say that first, the Great Recession can be termed as the fundamental cause of weakening the Spanish health system. Also, the inappropriate governance policy that were put in place at that time. But looking back, since 2002, where the complete devolution to regions was, uh, was ended, there were dysfunctional features of the organization that amplified the damage brought by the budget cause goods of austerity. Uh, let me th uh, mention three fundamental systemic NHS problems. First is the weakness of its coordination center, including legal framework, human resources, uh, knowledge and information resources, uh, agencies and allied institutions, and financial levels to exert influence. The second is uh, the dysfunctional decentralization, evidenced by non earmarked health financing rules, an institutional rivalry that makes multi level governance difficult, and uh, confusion for accountability lines. And the third is that uh, the central and regional health authority have severely limited the regulatory, economic, contractual, and personnel powers. Therefore, there is little room for real health policies. In contrast with the, health, uh, the, the Great Recession, which, which was a shock from the economy to the health system, the COVID-19 pandemic represents a shock to the, com to the economy due to health problems. In the pandemic, there is a surprising conversion of the economic authorities. In a clear, a visible way, the economy depends on health, and solving health care and public health problems become a state priority. But it's important, it's not easy, no matter how much money you want to allocate, to rebuild deteriorated structures in the short term or to increase the human capital that has been eroded and demoralized. Urgent reconstruction plans that has a big political appeal have limited effect. Only intelligent and sustained reinvestment can recover assets. Despite uh, what I mentioned that our system has been resilient, today we see three fractured lines that I will only mention. First, primary care is in crisis. Second, we are observing the increased use of private insurance and the use of private health care by the population. And third, we are also observing the disaffection of professional and the moral erosion of the commitment to institutions and organizations that are very important and, and worrisome problems. What is relevant for these three failures of resilience is that first, they were generated by austerity policies of more than a decade ago. Second, they were applied in a system with structural weaknesses not addressed by the necessary reforms. And third, they were not properly managed due to poor governance. Therefore, uh, what there seems to be a resilient response from a health system there might be damage that manifests itself later. However, there is a positive aspect to know. Just after the first wave, the obvious need for reform found a window of opportunity. A parliamentary commission for social and, Reco and economic reconstruction was launched with, in July 2020, came to a program with broad and consensual health system reforms. The 87 health system reform measures that were widely agreed upon and approved could be a fundamental roadmap for a possible state pact for the NHS. Many civil society organizations are asking for it. Thank you very much.
there for you to pick up on that notion of there being a package of reforms that somehow has consensus and long-term support? Over to you. Uh, well, as I think to start, uh, first of all, I would like uh, to to thank uh, the poll because it's one of the main questions. Uh, the main result uh, was uh, the importance of the commitment of the political governments. And as uh, Jose Ramon finished his talk, I would like to start just with that. Just to, just, just to finalize, I think uh, Jose Ramon uh, expressed the resilience as a very complex situation. But I would like to start with the end of the Jose Ramon talk, the importance of the commitment from the political uh, people, population. And I think for that, uh, for us, is a very start point, this consensus in, re in relation with the importance of the reconstruction of the national health system. This that was in the middle of the highest period of the pandemic, that was an important discussion, not only with the parliamentary people, but also with many experts like Jose Ramon, helped to build a roadmap that strengthens the important steps that we need to, to follow. I would like to stress the importance that we are in the middle of a very important crisis, probably it's an international crisis when we talk with other countries. We are not the only country, but this, this, is, this is not uh, something that for us is a good news. It's also something that we need to, to deep in our conversations, where the population asks and is looking for care attention more than ever, when we see the figures, we see incredible numbers. For instance, in Spain, 33 million people visit the emergency room a year for a population of 46 million people. More than 260,000 consultations in primary care. It's incredible the amount of people that need attention. And where the important health problems uh, so, sorry, mental health problems are increasing a lot. And there is an important disaffection, mainly for the human resources, as Jose Ramon said, but also for the population that are looking for other care, as uh, also uh, Jose Ramon state. Then we need, uh, first of all, to strengthen, because we are very proud of our even with the crisis, we are very proud of our national health system, that even in a centralized country, we need to be, it's the only national health system that needs to be a strong coordination by the Ministry of Health. We also believe that primary care health is the key of a national health system for universality, for equity, because it's the primary care health, health system is able to solve most of the health problems of the population in a very efficient way. Also, we understand and we learn from the, from the crisis that we need a strong public health system. We need also to achieve the equity and universality for all the population that live in all our regions. And of course, we need to take care of our professionals. And we cannot forget that now all the technology help us a lot to get to get these results. Then this is, this is the, the summary of my presentation that is uh, just almost over, but uh, with this strength of the Ministry of Health that is so important to get this equity, this, co this quality of care, we are an important plan to try to help the primary health care with all these 12 commitments that of course start for the financing, but it's not enough. Of course, we need to care of our human resources. We need to improve the capacity of the resolution of primary care. We need to, in, to, 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 to use all the digital resources and all the technology resources to improve all of our system. And of course, we need to, to empower the primary care, to improve the governance, to give each, prof each sector is professional. The role, the main role that can do it, I think we, uh, uh, our primary care system is based mainly in doctors, in, in medical doctors, that of course are the main key of the, of the system, but we need to strengthen the role of other professionals. 
We, uh, as a public health, of course, we are trying to improve our public health system with a strategy that started uh, last year, with also to do a reform of our all our surveillance system, with also with a public health agency that we need probably with a new uh, uh, general election, probably we will need to do some uh, reassurements. Of course, to get all this equity, we have a quality plan for all, the whole system that is very important for us. And to do many specific things for professionals, because it's our main problem, as also you suggest in, a, in your poll, it is a, it's so important. And uh, just to finalize with this uh, digitalization that gives us so many opportunities to get the better data, the better analysis, to get the better policies, and also to use all this uh, digital data to improve the health of the population. Thank you so much. very much. I think that gives us such a strong sense of the challenges in Spain, the complexities, but also that way that you need to bring together. And for you, you're looking at primary health as the example in a way that brings everything together, the governance, the financing, the workforce, the professional roles, but above all, you're stressing the equity and the universality. I think now, if we could, we'll bring in some examples from some of the other countries where, again, quite concrete examples of the challenges and of the approaches that people are taking. If we can come to Jason from the Swiss federal level, who will tell us a little bit about their challenges and experience. Jason. Remarks uh, on the key priorities from the Swiss perspective. While well, Switzerland shares many of the same issues that were already discussed, our unique position as a small and federal direct democ de democ democratic country at the margins of the European Union might also provide some interesting insights for this discussion. Building on Spain's insights about the difficulties in a federalized system, I would like to begin by addressing multi-level governance, a crucial aspect of the Swiss Confederation. The Swiss health system has a strong tradition of decentralized decision-making and coordination, allowing for a flexible and locally adaptive response. In fact, we have no overarching federal frame framework for governance of the health system because, because of the subsidiarity principle in uh, which mandates that the federal setup of the country gives all power to the regions except in areas where the constitution has explicitly assigned competences for the federal level. However, in times of crisis, a national communicable disease legislation allows for a shift in these responsibilities to allow for a more coordinated response. The COVID pandemic has been a test for this escalation model and revealed the need for a revision of our National Epidemics Act. The legislation is currently being revised to ensure, to ensure that our legal framework is well equipped to effectively manage future health, health crises, such as emerging pandemics or the increasing threat of antibiotic resistance. The revision in Switzerland focuses on improving the structures and processes for managing epidemics and includes provisions for increased transparency and cooperation between the regions and the national government to ensure consistency in public health measures and responses across the country, thus enhancing the resilience of the health system as a whole. Uh, consultation on this draft legislation commences this summer in Switzerland and the new law will then go into parliament in 2024 or 2025. The second example I would like to share today is linked to the direct dem democratic elements in the Swiss governance system. Swiss voters not only stand amongst the few people in the world who have been able to directly vote on their pandemic management laws, but the Swiss electorate also approved a federal popular initiative aimed at enhancing the working conditions and attractiveness of the nursing profession with a whopping 67% in November 2021. This means that the people actually directly mandated the Swiss government on the federal level to strengthen the nursing profession and to ensure provision of high quality care. 
the initiative is now uh, being implemented in two stages. The first stage uh, is launching in the middle of next year and aims to improve domestic education and training. National and regional governments have pledged up to 1 billion Swiss francs over an eight year period to support the training of nurses and promote, promote advanced and specialized nursing roles. In a, in a further stage, the working conditions and career development opportunities in the nursing uh, for nursing are then improved. So thank you very much for your attention. Jason, thank you. I think that sense of, of the difficulty of governance when you have such ultra decentralization and the immense power that comes from a real mandate is a really interesting combination. Hugh, I don't know how you feel about the mandate of the British government, but I pass for you to some comments. We've got two representatives from the British government over there, so you can ask them. I'll give you my take from somebody who analyzes the UK health system, but isn't part of government. So what I think the priorities are just so you know the context is like we've heard from other countries the health system in england is in crisis it's under massive pressure uh we've got about 7.3 million people waiting for routine hospital treatment at the moment about 360,000 of them and waiting more than a year uh, pressures on hospitals emergency departments are grim people are waiting longer for primary care so uh the, the public are facing a lot of challenges with the health system and their satisfaction has, has dropped Significantly, the pandemic clearly is a part of that caused big disruption, but the underlying causes are much longer run, uh, underfunding of the healthcare system, workforce shortages. Uh, it's not just about the pandemic. From my perspective, there's four, four big priorities for strengthening the resilience of the health system in the UK, some of which government's acting on, others they're not. The first is just strengthening the basic capacity of the healthcare system. Joseph's right, it's not just about beds, but they help. Uh, it's not just about staff, but they help too. Uh, uh, we went into the pandemic with fewer beds, uh, hospital equipment, nurses, doctors per capita, the most co comparable countries. So just strengthening the underlying capacity of our healthcare system is important. Workforce is the big one. We often talk about numbers of staff. Our big problem is keeping them workforce retention. So pay, well-being, uh, which is which is critical. We're not going to train our way out of a retention crisis in, in our country. The other part of capacity is the capital investment that we need to have modern buildings, equipment, so we can be flexible to respond to shocks. Uh, the second big priority is really making sure the, cap the, uh, the capacity is in the right places. We often focus on hospitals. We've talked about primary care, which is a clear priority for strengthening. But in the UK, like other countries, long-term care services are on their knees. The system is a, a threadbare safety net, only available to people with the highest needs, the lowest means. Uh, we've had politicians that have continually promised to reform that system and then ducked it. Uh, and, and we're not going to have a strong, resilient healthcare system unless we have a strong, resilient long term care system. We're coming up to an election next year. That's got to be a priority for political parties that want to run uh, the UK. Uh, I worry that it, it won't be. The, 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 the next big area is the, the wider health of the population. Uh, so again, what we've learned, you know, we've, we already knew it before the pandemic, but it illustrated very clearly is that you can't have a resilient healthcare system unless the population is healthy. And that means investing in social economic conditions that, that shape health, income, jobs, education. Uh, we don't have a national strategy to reduce health inequalities in England. We did in the 2000s. Uh, evidence shows it was it was pretty successful in places at reducing gaps in in life expectancy, which over the last decade has been stalling. We've got growing gaps between richer and poorer areas. So a, a key priority for strengthening the resilience of our health system has to be putting in place a cross-government, cross-departmental strategy for reducing health inequalities. The final point, I know we need to move quickly, it's about making sure decisions are made at the right level. Uh, Joseph touched on this. There's often a debate about centralization versus decentralization. We have the same debates in the UK, which is you know, a highly centralized political system by international standards. Um, and so the big question for us is how we get the right balance between central uh, decisions and leadership and, and local control. Well, we've just embarked on a reform of our healthcare system uh, to establish 42 strong regional bodies that are supposed to be managing budgets for health services, coordinating between health and social care. Um, that's the right direction. The challenge is, do they have the right investment support from national leaders to make change happen? And that's um, something we'll see over the next 
couple of years. I'm being rushed by Susie, so I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Hugh. That's good, good detection. I have to say, there's lots that's coming up that's that's you know echoes back to what Pilar was saying about equity and to the challenges that that Jason has in a different context. And although I know that um, Kent and Somerset, who are from the UK Department of Health, come from a very different setting, I know that these are the same issues that they are also looking at and addressing in in, in their work. If we can come to Sophie now, who is from Nams. Ah, I give you this for now, and then I'll take that one. So regarding France, uh, so being in, building up on what you just said, uh, we are a very highly centralized country uh, with a fragmented um, management. Uh, the sectors, primary care, secondary care, and long-term care, are managed. There is a dual management between the ministry, the government, and the statutory health insurance, and um, even within the budget, the budget is all split. It. So it doesn't help for coordina coordination, as we've, we've seen with the pandemic, the uncoordinated response, which was, was mostly at the beginning hospital centered. Um, so um, I wanted to talk about um, some experience we had, we had uh, lately um, regarding uh, the, the failure of negotiation we had with uh, physicians uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, one of the reasons was that uh, regulators uh, wanted uh, to uh, condition fees uh, to um, physicians being more involved in um, uncare, out of hour services, uh, and also under areas, also regarding gatekeeping uh, patient lists and accepting new patients. Uh, so, really, in France, we're also facing uh, some uh, geographic distribution uh, issues, like in many other countries. Uh, historically, uh, physicians have, have the free choice of place of practice. Uh, most professionals do, except for pharmacies, it's for legal reasons. And uh, they've been, we've been implementing uh, incentives for many years, but it doesn't work as much as we would like to. And uh, finally, uh, another issue regarding uh, innovation and new services, we need to find the right balance uh, to um, facilitate uptake for healthcare professionals, but also for patients. So um, basically, um, not, we, need, we need not forget that there are tools, so if they're not used, uh, there is no value. And what we've been experiencing, like regarding telehealth and teleconsultation, at the beginning we did, we did um, conditioning on prior knowledge of the patient for the physician to be able to do a consultation, and then we loosen it up during the pandemic. And then it, it did uptake very well. We also had a, a full reimbursement. Now we're coming backwards with a less 70% uh, reimbursement, for example, and no prior knowledge anymore. So basically, it's a step by process for everyone, for regulators, for healthcare professionals and patients, for the uptake of all those service innovation. Thank you. Sophie, thank you. I think it's a really useful reminder that we come with solutions and we have to remember that, you know, although innovation is part of resilience, unless you're able to back it up with how it into organizationally, in terms of professional behaviors and uptake, it's it's not necessarily the solution it, it might be. Now I'd like to come, Patrick, to you. I think you have a microphone. Well, Patrick's come from this academic heritage from the Netherlands. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Susie. Well, I have here in front of me, um, I think it's nice, um, an old definition of WHO about what is a good health system. So I think decades old or something, I use it in classes. And it states, a good health system delivers quality services to all people when and where they need them. The exact configuration of services varies varies, important word, I guess, from country to country, but in all cases requires a robust financing mechanism, a well-trained and adequately paid workforce, reliable information on which to base decision and policies, well-maintained facilities and logistics to deliver quality medicines and technologies. I think nice and short definition of resilience. Uh, and I guess the thing here is that resilience, from my perspective, is a lot about inputs actually and a lot of what we've did in the past decades was discussing outputs it's not bad but i think a lot of results about inputs and and if you for example say 
primary care is in crisis, as it's in many countries, right? Also in analysis in crisis. How can a system that's in crisis be a solution? Uh, so I think we first need to fix it <laughs> before we, uh, and we should actually, but before we, we, before we go further. Um, and then in the Netherlands, of course, we also had the bad problem. But uh, what Joseph was talking about, which is also inputs. Um, but our problem was too many beds in nursing homes. And most people at the first wave were dying in nursing homes, which in the Netherlands is the biggest in the world. Um, uh, so I think a lot is about inputs. And if I then go to the situation in the Netherlands, I think we do three things. So one is about increasing inputs in public health. So strengthening public health, uh, giving more resources, make it more centralized, better outbreak management, et cetera. <clears throat> Second, um, in the Netherlands, we kind of find out that we decentralize, decentralize so many things that we now are more oriented towards collaboration and, and bringing the region in somehow. I mean, the Dutch system has no region, right? I mean, it's one of the very few worldwide where the region is totally absent in healthcare. Uh, so we bring that in. Uh, concentration in tertiary care and the government uh, increases all kind of underwriting. What's kind of interesting is that the very strong capitalization of the Dutch healthcare system has not been hurt at all during the COVID crisis. So we had 30% solvency, we still have 30% solvency. Um, so we like to save, I guess, and I sometimes think, you know, that that we should we should turn part of that into like inputs like workforce education and and, and such stuff. Um, and then finally, if we look uh, what I said about inputs, you see there is still uh, in the Netherlands at least, but probably more countries, this 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 thinking about lean and mean healthcare systems. And I know at the beginning of the COVID, some people were questioning that, you know, aren't we too lean and too mean? You know, should we be a little bit more, you know, a little bit more? Um, and in the Netherlands, actually, you know, we we will become even more lean if, if the government gets its way, which is the plan, uh, because actually the, the budgetary growth path is, is, is declining, um, uh, still declining in the upcoming years. Uh, although, but we do have a very big, um uh covenant uh this is last last sentence uh, susie sorry we do have a, a very big covenant everybody agrees to um uh and our main narrative is we want more appropriate care and appropriate care is a lot it means zero uh footprint climate footprint it also means evidence-based it means like uh, concentrating on lower social economic classes it means digitalization care to the home so it's a lot it's a lot of the things who are here as well but i'm i'm not sure i mean this is output and i think you know resilience is a lot of input so i leave it there patrick thank you you started with a list of the ideal for the health system of a very short long list and at the end with one for what's appropriate care and i think your, your stress on inputs does make sense but i think there's also something in resilience which is about the capacity of the system to adapt to shock and to reconfigure itself in response to shock is perhaps a little bit beyond input but i think thank you very much to all of our contributors we've had really interesting things i hope you'll stay and re reflect now because we're going to go first to matthias to see about the online comment and then the two of us will collect some comments from the from the room and we're hoping that you will have a chance to sort of bring more of your experience in. Matthias. Thank you so much, Susie. And unfortunately, there was not com coming so much through the chat box. And I guess because your accounts were so fascinating. And, you know, I fully understand why we call this actually the perma crisis, because when Repu started, actually, that this, the Spanish system, according to your um, narrative, was a sound one. And then the austerity policy, the responses to the financial crisis, broke it in some way and Pillar explained to us um, how to fix it actually you know starting with the governance digitalization human resources different stories we heard actually from Jason you know Jason I felt that seems to be relatively resilience actually and then Hugh says yeah COVID has been very very
around the corner, you know, which is the climate crisis, which we need to take into account as well. And I would like now to collect from you, Susie, a um, couple of um, questions, you know, a um, couple of insights. Um, Tid, I see you here right in front of me from Slovenia. <laughs> You're from the Public Health Institute. And by coincidence, a partner in the observatory. So how is um, Slovenia navigating through these crises? How is it affected and what are the main priorities moving from it? Well, uh, similarly, as uh, already mentioned, we are now experiencing quite some difficulties in primary care, uh, which arise partly from the low interest of uh, junior doctors to decide for a career. Um, the shifts of personnel from primary care back to hospitals and similar uh, also pushed some nurses away from the, the good work they were doing in prevention. Uh, and, of course, um, generally speaking, I think there are strong problems uh, of governance. And currently, the gov the, um, I think the ministry is opening so many topics at the same time that it's becoming a bit overwhelmed. Uh, one of the priorities, which clear priorities of the government is the so-called digitalization. Sometimes we say that it is a new term from what we used to call IT in health, what we used to call e-health, and now we are calling it that digitalization. Uh, there is also uh, money from the recovery fund for that. Uh, we'll see how this story develops. The approaches taken by the ministry initially were not uh, really welcomed by our institute. <laughs> so now we, we are moving forward. Uh, on the workforce, I would strongly support the ideas of uh, having a particular activity supporting workforce in primary care, both doctors and nurses. Excellent. So it's not only the capacity of beds and people, but also the governance capacity, actually, you know, with all many new proposals. Susie? Not to respond quite yet. I'll collect a comment here from, from Clark. Hello. Yeah, great. Thank you, Susie. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, so I'm Clark Rushbrook from the UK Department of Health and Social Care. Um, I just wanted to add to what Hugh said to recognise lots of um, lots of the uh, the challenges you outlined and um, something else that i would i would add as well because i think the panel mentioned or one of the speakers mentioned the wider socio-economic determinants of health so something that's a big challenge at the moment particularly in the uk is kind of rising uh, rising levels of inactivity due to health and um, so this is something that the UK government is addressing. It's big on the chances list. There's been some funding announced to try and help um, help people a get back into the workforce that are suffering with uh, long term uh, long term health conditions, um, poor physical or mental health as well. So, um, but actually, we're still seeing that's quite a big problem. So, um, uh, so I wanted to just add that, and also just to reflect as well in case people in the room and online aren't aware so he mentioned we and is right we don't have a strategy for specifically reducing health inequality um earlier this year the government announced a major condition strategy uh, and that will set out a comprehensive approach to addressing ill health and early mortality in England um, and tackling health disparities and hopefully narrowing the gap by looking at kind of uh, lots of lots of the long term major conditions as a whole and how, how uh, health and care systems can treat those. Um, so, yeah, thank you. So one of the themes we've heard here, which are coming up and no surprise because we have many uh, people from governments here is the governance, you know, how do we actually um, make the decision and implement them? And I have here uh, a dear colleague from the Belgium government and we know Belgium has some complexities with very many different levels of uh, government and uh, in, a, in, a, in an interesting way uh, working together. So what is your experience about, you know, addressing the crisis and um, uh, responding to it as a government, Anna? Thank you for spotlighting <laughs> like this. Uh, uh, maybe I just can just say that uh, there will be an evaluation uh, in Belgium uh, about uh, how we, we dealt with the, the COVID crisis and governance will be one of the issues we would like to, to look uh, more into detail uh, to have some, some recommendation. But uh, yes, Belgium is a federal state as many of the other states are here, so we uh, have some 
organization which could be uh, complicated and i will not explain how we, we work uh, here in belgium but um uh in time of crisis i think uh, this uh this organization can be put uh, under pressure and so maybe some adjustment uh, uh, are needed also but so we will have a, a proper evaluation soon so apparently that is fully on the radar of the government and they try to see you know how to can how, how to do better or how to improve and strengthen the governance of the the country thank you so much susie shall we go back to our panelists now yes Excellent. so Maybe we have a quick round of reflections uh, from you colleagues. And um, I start the other way around. I start with Patrick very, very, very quickly, Patrick. And then you please, uh, oh, you got a microphone. <laughs> yes, okay. So it's um, a bit difficult, a different, I think all good points actually. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, I, I, I totally agree. What, what comes into mind though with me is that in the end, it's it's a lot about are you able as a governor, as a government, to solve a real problem of people. Uh, so thinking about social economic differences, for example, in health, um, and we can of course make very very nice statements and very nice policy papers, and 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 they look very fine in, in on paper and, and and good and reasonable and coherent, but in the end. Uh, and, and I think that's what COVID kind of learns. Are you as a government able to help somebody somewhere in the country who is in need? And I think, you know, what we've learned is that that's not always the case. Patrick, that's of course great. But on the other hand, next to you, Hugh just said that they have the experience with a very effective program, you know, and when the program was dropped, you know, the, the um, inequalities uh, raised, started to raise again, actually. But Maybe you uh, you go next. Yeah. So I'll caveat with mo moderately effective program. Um, yeah, I guess two reflections. One, the the just the, the challenges we're describing are so common. So this sort of thing is brilliant because we can learn from each other about how to address challenges in primary care and so on. The second is, as you say, a lot of the challenges we're describing are about social and economic conditions that are driven by factors largely outside the healthcare systems remit and so the question is well how does the healthcare system get involved through intersectoral action through collaboration which uh, the uk government are promoting through reforms in in uh, in england um which is good but also recognize the limits and therefore what's the other political intervention that is needed to address those those conditions um, and that's a challenge we have in the uk context where we've had um, uh, large cuts in spending to uh, wider social economic services over the last 10 years and no amount of investment in the in the NHS over the long run is going to address that. So I think a lot of the comments have picked up this tension between what does the healthcare system do, what the other actors do. Shall I, shall I pass down the line? We, we could do, can I just give a heads up, at least for real, we haven't heard from you for a little while, but we do plan to come back to you. So you shout whenever it's good for you. Yeah, shall we go to being mindful of time? Being mindful of time, I think we go back to you, Pilar, and uh, for, for a couple of comments as well. Please, do you have something you want to add, Jason? No, probably the, the, the biggest challenge we have is that we need to rethink our system, but solving the needs of health population every day. And it's true that we are able or all of our countries are able to solve many, many health problems of our population. But it's true that the disaffection is so big that we need to think so much about how we organize our system to improve our governance of our system, that all the effort we are made with the, our human resources, our financing, need to improve and get a, big, a bigger affection of our population, a bigger affection of our health services. Yes. Our, our that's, that's also population. another common theme that we still need to invest in health system, even so we all know that the fiscal space is probably contracting, you know, and we need to really have the good arguments, you know, to, to convince the other sectors and the finance ministry. Um, can we have Sophie very briefly before we go to Lisa Maria? So um, regarding uh, France, what we're trying to do is uh, to, to have a better response to the population needs. We are, we are building a reach out program we did during the pandemic for 
funeral groups. Um, and we're also um, trying to, um, we're adapting uh, the rules for uh, like advanced practitioners who were supposed to be under the supervision of the physician now can may have some direct access. Hopefully it will go through uh, legally and uh, for implementation so they can go to underserved areas where there are no GPs and uh, have a better response for, for populations. Um, that kind of things. Thank you. And uh, very Yes, Lisa Maria, please. Thank you. Well, from the observatory's point of view, I think it's interesting to note that how we gradually have, we, we analyzed the situation using different, uh, similar terms. It's like it was in the COVID crisis. We all started to run away with different approaches and then over time, our approaches converged. And I think that there is a similar type of phenomenon here that the analytical approaches that we have start to resemble each other. That's my observation from this panel. And then if I put my ministry civil servant hat on me, I have to say that I particularly liked Professor Repula's analysis of, of the situation and the healthcare. What it takes to have room for real health policies, it takes governance, resources, and reforms. And you particularly pointed to accountability lines in our legislation. And I think that that's something that we that work for the ministries have to think about seriously, because at the end of the day, our politicians have their hands bound by legislation. Over. Thank you so much, Lisa Maria. And thank you so much to all the panelists and a big applause, actually, because I think that was quite fascinating. I, I think you really managed in, in, in three, four minutes, you know, to really focus on the commonalities, but also the differences and also showing a little bit a way out of the crisis and showing how we could probably in the future strengthen our health system and this with a view towards the upcoming next crisis. And now, Joseph, uh, we hand back to you. The floor is all yours again. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much again. It was a good way to uh, stop this session because you talked about governance. So now what we want to hear is what is the role of the European and the national governance in supporting you, member states, supporting the resiliency of member states. So I'll ask you to move, but Pilar, and then I'll involve Isabel de la Mata, principal advisor at the DG Sante, the European Commission. We are extremely lucky to have the three presences of the Council here with us, representing the, the, the three countries, Ingrid Schmidt, if you want to join us, Senior Expert at National Board of Health and Welfare, Sweden. Pilar Aparicio still here, which is the next presidency. Uh, Ingrid, we're just uh, about to finish your presidency. You must be quite relaxed now. And then Anne Swolver, who is about to start six months on the line and who must be very stressed. So by order of less to more stress, Ingrid less stressed. Pilar, quite a stress because it's starting on, and you even more stress. Please take the take the take the the floor, and then I'm going to ask uh, Vesna Petric. Vesna Petric has a number of hats. I'll say only two here today. Vesna, we love you because you are. We always love you, but we love you because you are the chair of the executive board of the World Health Assembly, and we'll ask you difficult questions about double Joe and what double Joe should be doing as we do as we'll do to Isabel and uh, Martin uh, are you joining us as well Martin is someone else so apart from sorry Vesna apart from being in the World Health Organization executive board you are of course a key senior expert in the Ministry of Health in Slovenia and then my colleague uh, Martin McKee co-director of the observatory professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine but I love him today because He's the president of the BMA as well, but he's not going to talk about the British doctors. But I love him today because he was the scientific chair of the Monti Commission that looked at the various uh, approaches to international governance to uh, learn from the crisis and support the resilience of our health systems. So I'll start voting because, you see, one of my dreams one of, uh, of COVID, I thought, well, the, 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 the silver line in the cloud was going to be more international governance. It's going to be more countries surrendering their sovereignty, pulling it together because it's a public good, isn't it? If you look at the books, public good is exactly a 
crisis, a crisis like COVID, but a crisis like refugees, a crisis like no, 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 not yet, not yet. Put, put the, let me, let me put the questions first, because otherwise I cannot influence people, you know. I'm sorry. It's okay. Don't worry. So uh, exactly, here you have the, um, you are exactly okay. No worries. Yes. I can do it. So I can keep talking. Don't worry. No problem. So what I'm going to ask you now is to vote as to whether doing it international governance isn't subsidiarity very important. Why should the EU or the WHO get into health systems? There you are. So just keep that for a second. You saw the slide already. Eh? Please, those who have joined us, uh, I know there are lots of people online. This is there. Look at the code and now look at the questions. Okay. Okay. Don't vote yet. Just look at the questions, please. Voting is a serious thing, friends and colleagues. You need to reflect. Lots of populism. I'm a populist today. I'm trying to influence you. Okay? Don't vote yet. Look at it. Subsi okay, there we are. Subsidiarity is paramount. No role for international government health systems. How many votes are going to have there? Okay. Number two. There is lack of poor evidence on the impact of those mechanisms. Martin McKee. Is there a good evidence that these international governance mechanisms work, actually? Uh, three, WHO, EU, and most multilateral organizations, FESNA, Isabel, have no leverage. You don't have the tools because the member states don't give you the tools. OK? Well, you can disagree with me in a minute. I'll let you. Four, well, let's face it. Politicians don't care about this. There's lack of political will. Why they would surrender power to Brussels, to Copenhagen, or to uh, Geneva, right? And five, I don't know what's going on, but it's bloody frustrating. So you can vote that one as well. I think I would vote for that one, actually, to tell you the truth. Yes, I got to vote. Thank you. OK, friends, so please look at this. Look at these results, because I'll ask you to comment on those. I think everyone is voted, Jora, or how are we doing? Have voted or oh, come on. But I see in the room people are not voting. Up here. Are ah, you watching who's voting? Yeah. So it's important you all participate. We don't have uh, too much abstention. Maybe we can ask so clearly, clearly, lack of political will, no political incentives to pull sovereignty and share power. Isabel, the story of your line of your life working for the EU. I know. But you were before held at a chef for Spain. So you be you've been in both sides of the equation. And no leverage or tools. For you, again, and you, the member states here, are the ones who are not giving the tools and the leverage to this organization. So I'll be asking you this question in a minute. But now we have a more interesting question, which is the following one. With the same, uh, the same link works, no, Jora? Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. So another one is, now it is a difficult one, but it's really important you think about that so we can get a discussion going on. So now we focus on the European Health Union. Choose three of the following responses. It requires thinking. I'm so sorry. It's homework, but otherwise we don't get engaged. Make universal health coverage a reality. Yes, that's always a referee, right? No, but here we're talking more than that. If you go to the European Parliament these days, right, colleagues, right, Isabel, they say make universal health coverage a reality. Ensure EU access and quality for all. This is. You can go to every country to be treated of cancer, to be treated of any intervention, any surgery. That's what your health co uh, coverage would be in Europe. I know, buy on the sky. Fine. Number two. What's number two? Number two. A strength, strengthen EU purchasing. It's moving. <laughs> regulatory powers to access technology and medicines. We learn about the vaccine, right? It's been one of the most effective way we work together. Should we extend these powers, as we'll hear from the Swedish presidency, to access antibiotics, pharmaceuticals, and technologies? We have a market of almost 400 million purchases, uh, consumers that can purchase together. OK, number, where am I? Number, I don't know anymore. Number three, achieve a full labor market potential with shared regulation for health workers. If the labor market had cross borders, we should have shared regulation. What's the point of training an institute there if then it's going to go there, so somewhere else? 
we should plan and regulate together. Number four, a step up implementation of e-digital health. We've been talking about that, but it's not happening as it should. Among others, Isabel, because member states don't have their act together in digital health. There are still many systems. Are you saying no one has heard me all this time? Are you serious? They heard me. But they heard me. Because I threaten you to start again. Eh? I love to talk. You know that. Okay. Oh, they voted. Yeah, but without my influence. Okay. Support. I, I'll go very fast. There's a lot from DG reform now that they are supporting health systems reforms and transformations. And actually countries like uh, Austria, that we'll speak later, like uh, Slovenia, like Belgium and others have been benefiting of that kind of work. I'm getting there, I promise. Six, harness and build and expand on health security powers. Is enough? Is CDC here? Do we have more on that? That's uh, the, an important question. Number seven, tackle health determinants. Really, we are not giving the EU the power okay, of health, but it has the power because the internal market, because of the trade, has huge impa impact on the health determinants. Shouldn't we have a health policy that looks beyond Santé to other sectors? We had a very interesting discussion that the other day in Santé on the, on the subject. Eight, let's go for it. Reform the EU treaty. Give the EU health legal powers. Do we agree on that, uh, Pilar? Are we going to say that from Spain? You are watched by hundreds of people on the outside there. Just I warn you. Nine, subsidiarity is paramount. The EU mandate is strong enough. I got 6% that they say that. Interesting. So 6% are saying, you got enough, Isabel, you shouldn't have more. OK, I'm sorry for this long introduction. And uh, just uh, leave that, leave that, uh, that uh, please, uh, uh, Jora. So we have that in the background. People may, may, when they hear you, Isabel, maybe they'll change their vote. I don't know. Is it possible to change the vote, uh, Jora? Anyway, Isabel, you heard what member states won loud and clear they they tell you what problems they had you know i don't know you can do much about decentralization centralization at national level but you can do a lot on health workforce you can do a lot on digital you can do a lot about training learning from each other you have you have many tools what kinds of ways you're supporting member states at the at the moment to have an impact on the resilience Mm -hmm. And then allows the member states uh, to, 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 to come back to see what they want, actually. Okay. I mean, we have some tools. We can do uh, a lot of things, but we can do uh, some things. And we have uh, uh, always the legislative, the funding, and the coordination, these uh, three kinds of powers. Of course, we respond to the member states and, and to the other stakeholders that uh, are our master, as you used to say. And we do what, uh, what, uh, what we are requested, because uh, otherwise uh, uh, and this is not going on. I mean, we have uh, mechanisms that have to be approved. We do a legislation. We propose a legislation. We never do a legislation. This has to be approved by the, the countries, by the parliament. We propose funding that this has, be, uh, has to be approved by the, by the member state. And we propose sometimes coordination and this has to be done by the, by the member state. So the subsidiarity issue is always there. And the paramount example is the pandemic. During the pandemic, everybody wanted to be coordinated until the very moment that the things uh, began to be a little bit better. In that moment, uh, all the coordination disappeared. But from from one day for the for the another the the wish uh, for the for the joint procurement or the wish that the commission has Do to say a pandemic to strengthen you then is that the only way <laughs> we i always change uh, uh, i mean what what allow us to propose all this uh, european health union package um that uh, with the, the main regulations in health security but also the the pharmaceutical package because i uh, was uh, one of the of the main issues is that we didn't have enough uh, treatments vaccines uh, and etc so what we allowed uh, us to move and to move uh, for the for the first uh, regulations quite quickly uh, was uh, was the pandemic uh, everybody was desperate uh, to 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 have more to coordinate to to to, to be able to to fight together 
but now things are going a little bit more, uh, I mean, I mean uh, different. Um, uh, whatever has been said in the in the slide, if we don't change the, the treaty, we cannot change. I mean, we need a mandate, and the only mandate comes from the from the uh, from the treaty. The the Article 168 uh, says what it says, and sometimes we we travel around uh, with uh, with the other articles with the internal market. This is what we use for all the legislation about the health services. And, and yeah, even sometimes um, the member states are quite keen on doing something, but we have still the cross-border uh, health services directive that you remember was approved in 2011. We still have infringement procedures against member states. So uh, make your your mind clear. Do you want do you want it that? I, I, that's what I want that? to ask you. Uh, sorry, yeah. you have to answer this question. Yeah. What? Do you really think they want this cross-border member states because they're dragging their feet? They requested. I mean, <laughs> and uh, and you you remember that was very painful uh, issue. I mean, took a lot of time since yeah, the observatory was involved in an impact yeah, yeah, assessment. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, and we had uh, we had this um, uh, la Europa Europa de la Santé. Uh, de la salud uh, that uh, that was developed during the one of the previous Spanish presidency in 2002 uh, before the European Health Union. Um, but uh, yes, uh, I mean, member states seems to 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 want or not to want uh, some uh, some all the issues. But uh, but um, but this is clear for for many of the of the legislations that uh, okay. is always advancing. In one Could side, we look together at this voting because it's quite interesting isabel uh i don't think I'm, I'm i wonder member states here please pay attention to that i wonder whether it reflect your views because they're asking for support on reforms which is health system reforms subsidiarity remember that word number one two if they understood well our voters they're saying they want fewer access all over europe look at number two 46 percent they say they should be able to access all over europe so you know uh, bulgarian can go to german uh, germany germany can come to spain wherever uh, a step up let me look at the number four in the voting tackling health determinants at the eu level a fully integrated eu health policy in the internal market hmm. they don't like sante to get involved in that i believe right so uh, but this is what our voters are telling us yeah, but our so what voters... do you think about this 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 voting is that representative <laughs> the, of the, the voters are not the member state this is different the people in, in really? this room are outside they, and outside they are, they're not member state they are not the, they are not the official so you are disempowered friends I'm of so the sorry. member states count. <laughs> so, because uh, the, the issue of uh, universal health coverage in the sense that has been mentioned so that everybody can go wherever they want and be treated, we were discussing that in uh, before the, the directive. I mean, in 2002, uh, we were discussing that and then it uh, was uh, watered down what uh, was in the, in the directive. And at the end, I understand because uh, someone has to pay. I, I can uh, wanted to go, I don't know, to Germany, but who is going to pay for me? Uh, Spain, but then it's not universal uh, health coverage. That means that, uh, money, yeah, money, I can money. go wherever you want, uh, but uh, someone has to pay. I, I can go now, but I pay myself in, on private. So make another, Perfect. so not Short possible. question, and we need to move to our colleagues. Yeah. Uh, why people are saying a step up implementation of EU digital health is a no brainer. Why is taking such, uh, so much time since i know who i am working in this field we heard about interoperability digital health plans why is it taking such a long time why europe cannot get it act together uh, but uh, the the legislation we are doing that just now uh, it's now that we are discussing the been late no we've been around we've been talking about digital health for a long time we were talking a long time, but we didn't have the legislative powers. We, we needed to use the cross-border health uh, healthcare directive because the e-health can link to that. Then to develop something in the digital Europe that was not just uh, health. And now that we are linking those dots, we could propose uh, that. And now it's still in discussion in the parliament and the council. Let's see. But interoperability uh, is is an issue for for sure. But not only not only in the European Union. I mean, in Spain, I, I go to La path and i don't i cannot have my my results in cruces so uh, perfect, perfect place to move to member states let's blame member states ingrid you no, first not you first ingrid uh, the question to the three presidencies are uh, colleagues are what is the view of your capitals and i don't know how much you can say as much as you can please about this european health union about the powers we need to give them 
the public goods, the common share public goods. What is your view first? And what is your presidency? Take, tell us one thing on your presidency. But I'll go back to you. I'm just interested in the three of you. Let's start first with how, what should we give to, uh, to Europe, to European Union? And uh, please, the other two presidencies, see whether you agree on the points of Ingrid. Ingrid, you start. Well, I think, um, not going into those complicated things that you two were discussing, but <laughs> uh, 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 taking uh, uh, some ground in what happened during the pandemic, uh, for example, I think it is it was obvious to Sweden and to most of us here that uh, we need international cooperation to handle the uh, threats of the future. The uh, new pandemics, um, AMR, antimicrobiotic, no, antibiotic resistance, which was one of the uh, priorities for Sweden's presidency this time too. Uh, so I think in general, when it comes to the, the public health threats, I think it's obvious that we need more of cooperation and what mutual the, learning. On the other areas of health system? Pardon? What about in the other areas of the health system we have here, like uh, health I, workforce, uh, like uh, integrated EU health policy? It's too premature, perhaps, or you think we can move in the next commission in this area? I'll come back to you on that. And well, I think I, I'm not sure I can I can comment on that so precisely. Uh, however, I come I come myself from a perspective of of learning and to yeah. build uh, to use evidence to inform policy, and from a public health perspective. And having that perspective is obvious that we need to perfect. But tell us about your presidency, because you're really tackling one of the less questioned public good, antibiotic resistance, AMR, antimicrobial resistance. So it is really an issue that it, the borders don't matter, as we heard a yeah. trillion times. What are you doing in this field uh, in your presidency? You're about uh, to pro produce, or you already produced the council conclusions, no? You're about to, no? Uh, we are about to uh, produce council cons conclusions, uh, which would be recommendations to all uh, European member states to take action. And uh, it, it's building on that Sweden also had this question, um, highlighted this problem also in the uh, presidency 10 years ago, or maybe more, 14 years ago. And it actually resulted in that uh, most or all countries uh, developed a plan for uh, OMR and how to tackle it and how to uh, work against overprescribing of of antibiotics, to work with uh, animal feeding uh, regulations. Uh, this time. Uh, we, Sweden uh, hosted a meeting uh, that had the focus of how do we uh, with, uh, make new or, or create new antibiotics that actually can treat the infections that we are facing. Um, and even as, even if Sweden ha is quite, we have in a, quite, good position uh, because we started quite early with these problems and have worked through a number of different um, with the different act actors from the micro level in the system uh, to the higher level yes. it's still a, a huge a huge threat to yes. our modern and, and i believe system. actually the 21st the 21st of june uh, I got Dimi Pantelli, he has been one of the authors, the key author of a uh, brief the observatory did side by side exactly. with Sweden. I was just coming to that. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. I just think I uh, forgot. Because this is, forgot. Yeah, no, I did not forget Good that. Good for you. Uh, because uh, this is an example of how uh, knowledge can inf influence, uh, knowledge and ev evidence can influence policy. And so this uh, policy brief was uh, developed by the Swedish presidency together with the European Observatory. 
And we also have an upcoming uh, conference where you also are involved uh, from in the life science area. So, so here uh, it's, it's so clear <laughs> to me and to many of us, I know that uh, we need to just work further with this kind of col collaboration and and to uh, re to reach our politicians for to make the right decisions for for health. Perfect. Thank you very much. The 21st of June, with uh, with you and the Observatory, will be launching a brief analyzing the various tools and the ways that European countries can work together to purchase, to access innovation in antibiotics, to provide incentives and so on. Which is, I will go back to that. I'm sure there'll be many questions on that. Let me move now in the same order I mentioned to Spain. Pilar, first, uh, your view on those kinds of issues you saw there on the slide. We keep it in the slide. Uh, how does that look from the Spanish perspective? Uh, and secondly, give us one, max two priorities, as we heard from uh, Sweden that focused on the access to antibiotics at, at EU level. Give us your priorities of your presidency about to start in a few days that will strengthen this European Health Union. Well, uh, to start, uh, as we are living in a global world, is uh, is I mean, it's quite real that now the uh, the health problems are also world problems, and this is very important because the determinant of health are global determinant of health, and it means that uh, we need to have this global perspective, and that's the reason why we need to talk about health in the European Union or in WHO. And this is quite important because it, there are uh, many things uh, when we talk the determinants of health, like commercial determinants of health, that need a strong international regulation. And this is one of the things that uh, is very important for the European Union. Um, I mean, the, in, in our in our setting, but this is also uh, very important also for WHO to get this uh, this kind of uh, perspective. We talk uh, not only about the possibility of any, not only this pandemic, uh, further pandemics or further uh, cross-border problems, but uh, we are in the middle of the big uh, health, uh, climate change uh, health, and this needs uh, regulatory or regulation. Then I mean, of course, uh, we need uh, these uh, global institutions, uh, even if uh, we always need to go further and even if we have to deal, and I think that it is not easy at all to deal with the multilateralism that is so difficult when uh, you are trying to get together with the global problems, with the global, global solution. I'm very sorry, I need to answer. No, of course, you go, you go, you go. We know that uh, uh, Pilar today is on duty from the ministry and uh, take over from the ministry, the minister, in uh, key issues that we are undergoing in our country. And let's move to Belgium. Uh, Belgium, actually, uh, the last uh, two presidents ago, and Isabel will remember, together with Spain, there were the two presidencies, one after the other, like it's now, that actually started with a lot of that debate about the role of the European Union. Remember, Isabel? We were around, both of us, and you were not around. And actually, your minister, uh, uh, Van den Broeke, is a real analyst, is, is a health policy analyst about many other things on this field. He's, he's been doing research about the role of the European Union. He's a true European. So we are very excited about your presidency that I believe... Okay, sorry. Uh, so we'll go back to you at the end if that's okay. So, and um, I was saying that your minister now is putting on the table, I believe, a very progressive European Health Union agenda for your presidency. Can you say something more about that? Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, so the Belgian presidency will be next year. So for the moment, we are still preparing and I cannot announce any uh, priority at that moment, but maybe uh, I can already say a few words about our reflection uh, at this point, because I think, as you say, that, yeah, it, it goes a lot of discussion we had uh, today um, and uh, what do we expect uh, uh, to, to further this uh, European Health Union. So uh, yeah, just to say also that the Belgian presidency will come at the end of the Van der Leyen uh, 
Commission terms of office. So it will certainly be a good momentum to look back of what we uh, have achieved, uh, but also to, to look forward and try to influence the, the agenda of the next uh, commission. So that's the explicit aim yeah. of your presidency. Yeah. So really, the member states, really would like to, opportunity. to to have health high in the agenda of the next commission, and especially the resilience uh, of health and uh, health systems. So we are working with the observatory. Uh, we uh, ask the observatory to to screen the recommendation that have been made after the the, post, the COVID crisis uh, to see around which recommendation there are much uh, convergence and which uh, have been implemented or, or not. And I'm going to interrupt you. I know you cannot say the priorities, but what do you think are, that may not be in the presidency, but what do you think the important priorities are out there? Yeah. Not the presidency priorities. What okay. do you think out of this scanning we are doing? Yeah. Uh, we we are exploring uh, several uh, issues. Uh, um, many of them have already been mentioned uh, today, but like, yeah, uh, access to healthcare and especially affordable access to healthcare and how can the EU support access uh, through legal or not legal uh, instrument, uh, I think like uh, uh, the European semester or the, uh, the European uh, pillar of social rights. There are many EU instruments that can be uh, further developed uh, to support access to care. Uh, we are also thinking about exploring more uh, healthy population and how can the EU improve the health of the population because if it's of course a key factor in the resilience uh, of health to have a healthy population. Uh, so we would like maybe to, to see a little bit more in detail what can the EU do to, to finish uh, the unfinished uh, uh, agenda of the European Beating Cancer Plan, uh, but also yeah, to improve primary prevention at the uh, EU level. Thank but you. I think uh, one uh, issue that has been mentioned several times and that keeps you awake, it's the health workforce, so certainly uh, it will be an important uh, issue uh, to address at the EU level, uh, also with legal or non-legal uh, uh, instruments. And okay. maybe also I can also mention the issue of shortage of medicines. It's a point that uh, we would like to, to move further and to see how we can improve solidarity uh, between EU member states to, to face this uh, shortage of medicines uh, in short term, but also maybe in middle or, or long term. Perfect. Thank you very much. We're running late, my fault usually, in this case also. <laughs> so very briefly, Pilar, because we're going to conclude this at the end. Tell us one priority of your presence. You already made a huge point, a very important point about working together, the commonality, the challenges, the risks that we have to tackle together. Mm -hmm. Tell us one priority of your presidency that's believed particularly important. Briefly. Well, maybe just um, as, 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 as I said, the regulatory mark thing is uh, very important. And of course, we have an uh, important package that we Heritage from the Swedish presidency, and we will pass to the Belgian presidency. But also, I think that for us, it's very important all re things related to prevention and promotion of health. That is uh, th something that we can also regulate and at, at least to try to stress the importance, for instance, like obesity. And also, the big problem for us is the mental health situation of the, of the population in this, in this time. The question is how far are you prepare on the regulation for obesity? How much are we going to look at the main determinants and how much could the uh, European Union do that together? You know, like the, like the determinants of uh, the commercial determinants of health. In my dream world, in my letter to Father Christmas, I would like to see a world where those determinants could be uh, addressed, which is very important for WHO and the work you do as chair of the, of the, of the executive board of WHO. Do you have the? Do you think WHO has the the tools and the, the and has uh, do member states give the political will and the support to WHO to do the kind of work that that you need to do? Uh, well, you are a member state actually. Thank you for inviting me. I'll start with uh, continuing what Isabel has so nicely expressed. You know, all these international entities, organizations, name it UN, WHO, or EU. 
they are actually member states is the member states in charge you know they are the ones who rule uh, and this is not always understood well you know we are very critical to international organizations commission who and so on but we are the ones who are in charge and we have to take this role very seriously that is what we should do and uh, I think, you know, that everything is not so bad because at this international level, still we keep the values right. We do speak of values, we do say solidarity, equity, we are after these values and I think this is crucial because we have to have the values right first if we want to do anything later on. But what, what actually we are not doing so well is when we decide to go somewhere where we make all these decisions adopt the directives the resolutions and so on even if they are obligatory you know we don't implement them and so you this mean is, member states ignore all these resolutions they don't ignore they don't ignore they don't implement for different reasons you know and the reasons are several one reason that you mentioned is that you know our governments are subject to a lot of pressures even pressures from different lobbies and interest groups and so on for example for a long time we have decided at highest level so who we all agreed that we have best buys as a solution for the risk factors like tobacco uh, tobacco alcohol uh, and those products that are not good for nutrition but uh, we actually don't implement why don't we raise prices why don't we all why don't we implement uh, we don't implement uh, they uh, we always refer to political will it was always in the question but what actually is political will okay how we get to the political will who is uh, who is contributing to more political will you have to understand this and here we underestimate the power of civil society all the time we don't get them on board for example at the world health organization we have spent years for this fensa process to decide that they can speak and be accredited and have a statement here and there you know this is all wrong we have we should have them on board when we try to implement at the country level we should you know involve them in implementation yes. much better at all levels you know we are doing something in slovenia for example primary health care uh, acting at the community level as a leader to to get determinants health determinants right they do involve in, we have piloted this, we have invested a lot of EU money, by the way, you know, uh, to get these things right and to have this community approach, including all the stakeholders, including civil society. But that is not uh, so well understood at the global le level yet. We don't invest even in civil society. We consider them, they are there, but we don't invest in them. We should invest financially, we should invest with knowledge because it's not okay that they do whatever they do yeah. what they do should be evidence-based also so we should interact more with civil society for the implementation but that's not all implementing we should also understand who are the people that should have some ownership over what will be done uh, in the reform for example we understand that there are more than 70 percent of employees in health sector women but if we look who is in charge in health sector only 10 percent of people in charge are women so you yeah, know, yeah. where's the ownership of when it comes to implementation the key factor that you really do implement is that those people that will implement at the end are feeling like that's theirs you know otherwise implementation fails so these kind of things still need to be perfect. discussed but i Let i me... want to say something don't be depressed because we are moving in the right direction there are Thank many you. initiatives there for example you know uh, including behavioral science which european regional office of who has done looking at why people don't accept the measures that we impose on them like uh, uh, vaccination you know it's very very important and there are for example putting health high on the agenda of economic uh, entities like g20 and martin will this say is much a perfect more place to, this is to move really to martin important for the investments and so on for the finance ministries to understand so there are many processes going on that are in the right direction perfect so don't give up 
we should fight, but we Thank should you. also make sure that we are not everywhere. Because if I look at some people here, I know that today they are here, me included. Tomorrow they are somewhere else, so they have no time really to focus on implementation. That is also a problem. Thank Perfect. You. Yesterday, Vesna and I had a, a discussion over a couple of drinks mm -hmm. about not being and falling into the council of despair. Martin, you must be enjoying that very much uh, in the sense that you've been pushing for the next ministerial conference in Tallinn very much this idea of trust, this idea very much of bottom-up, is working with civil society, with the patients and with the doctors. But I don't want you to talk about that. I'd like you to talk as chair of the Monte Commission, scientific chair. You, put, you brought together a selection of past presidents of central banks, non-health people, to discuss how we could work in the international governance. And you put very, very fascinating uh, uh, mechanisms and tools. Is it working? <laughs> I mean, just open any newspaper today. You know, the idea that we could actually get this world to function. Uh, we well, are in an incredible. Not council of despair, no way. Well, you know, you Best asked me, it. but, uh, you know, as is well known, people have known me for years. Everything I've advocated over the last 30 years has not come to pass. So, you know, having me supporting something is probably the last thing you want. I would say, by the way, I agree 100% with everything Vesna said. But, yeah, the, the, so what, what do we do? You know, the reality of it is the international architecture is not working. And part of that is because the national architecture is not working. Most people in most Back countries... Back the blame to member states. Yeah, and, mo and, and agree totally with what Isabel was saying. In most countries, the majority of the population have no idea how legis legislation is passed, the role of the, uh, the separation of powers, the role of the court, uh, the role of the courts, the role of the parliament, and the role of the executive. Uh, I won't mention any particular well, countries. What do we do, Martin? This do we go on issue. the streets, but civil society? What well, do we do to yes, we that? actually do. And again, Vesna was absolutely right, because there are lots of ways of getting a true democracy, like citizens' assemblies, for example, really going out and consulting, co-creating solutions, and we just don't do it. So I think there is a lot, but what, why did we do what we did? Well, we looked at the international architecture and you can do a thought experiment. If the world was a country, who is in charge? Who is in charge of all of the functions? The legislature, the executive, the judiciary. We've got an international criminal court. We've got various instruments. We've got the United Nations. But if you've got an entity like the UN and the WHO with 194 countries that range in population size from 1.5 billion, like China and India, to 10,000, like Tuvalu, you are, and then you give them each one vote, the simple reality of it is that nobody, the powerful countries will never give the smaller ones the power Geopolitics. so we've got the security council and that you've got five permanent members who got together in you know, 1948 and we've got the legacy of that so we said well we've got to try and find some forum in which we can get something to work and as we looked around we looked at something that had worked now when the pandemic arose we did not have a global financial crisis we could easily have had one and a large part of the credit for that goes to the people who set up the Financial Stability Board after the global financial crisis in the, 20, in the 2000s. And those were people like Mark Carney and Mario Draghi and Jim O'Neill. And we had Jim O'Neill on our panel. So we looked to the G20. And remember, the G20 is not just 20 countries. Spain is not part of it, but it is, uh, has, is always there. You have country at the African Union representative. You have other countries from the region that holds the presidency. And what they had done in the Financial Stability Board was to widen the membership. I, I know we're, uh, so I can stop now, but just say we no, modeled, okay. well, we modeled what we, we, we proposed something there. We were very lucky. What is missing in all of this is leadership. There is a vacuum of international leadership at the minute, just as in many countries, there is a vacuum of national leadership. So the Financial Stability Board was able to be taken forward because there were people like Draghi and, and Carney who were able to take it forward. You know, Mark Carney, a central banker, former head of the Bank of England, Bank of Canada, has written a book, Values, which is a public health textbook. And so they were able to take that forward. Because Mario Monti, the chair of our commission, and Mario Draghi are very good friends, we got the Finance and Health Task Force in the G20. But now the G20 is paralyzed by Russia. So, you know, we've got the problems there. So we cannot divorce this from the international the global agenda. And then we get to very the situation, clear. and I won't mention the country, but if you check on Twitter, 
when you've got you know health ministers in member states tweeting uh, that they meet Tedros. And of course, the thing about this is that WHO will not impinge on their sovereignty. You know, sorry, cross-border threats cr cross borders. So when okay. you've got an attitude like that coming out, uh, and uh, you can find some it. light at the end of the tunnel, but switches on and off, as you can see. Matthias, what is on the right? What is on the? I hope this time we got more uh, more complaints. Or... Well, you will be pleased to hear that there are no complaints on the very. Uh, contrary, there were a lot of positive re remarks about the speakers and the discussion and what to learn from it. But there were two blocks of um, uh, rather comments coming in. One was um, just uh, raising the attention to joint action sharp on strengthening international health regulations and preparedness in the EU. So member states working together with the European Commission to strengthen the international health regulation, which is basically WHO. But the second uh, part was very much on the discussion you had with uh, starting with Wesna and with um, Isabel on uh, what citizens want, what patient wants, you know, and what member states want. And uh, many people see there's a little bit of a, a kind of contradiction, you know, that uh, citizens, patients very much in favor for more integration. But then policymakers, of course, they are much more cautious. They think about the cost, the implications, the legal frameworks. They are a bit uh, more careful. In any case, it was highly recommended and highly appreciated that the community, civil society um, played such an important role in the discussion. So that's Perfect. basically from so the So there are contributions echo what we heard from the room. Help me, Matthias. Let's find some okay. views from the room to add to that. And then I'll give you one minute each. Pilar, as you are concluding, I won't give you the minute now. I'll give you the three minutes later. And I'll give you a minute each for a reaction to these contributions and the views from the room. Can help me? Yes, thank you. Get the wine afterwards. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jose Martinez. Um, I didn't listen about uh, prevention. That could be important. And the other point is that the European Union is already spending hundreds of millions of euros in uh, funding startups and scale ups in the health sector. That probably uh, could be very helpful to uh, discover cancer, Alzheimer, all the things uh, earlier. And probably the spend of the local governments will be uh, smaller than uh, getting the treatment when you are um, very ill patient. So, well, I just wanted to to say this because I, I miss it and I'm not sure if there is any comment about it. Thank there you. is indeed a moonshot that uh, 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 Isabel will say something about, uh, the cancer moonshot and so on. And indeed, the determinants may be Pilar later on you want to say something because you were mentioning that already. Any other points, please? Can I have some more points from the... Or down here to Jason again, yes. because Jason is coming from a country and he portrayed it very nicely, you know, how many decisions are actually done democratically with the involvement of the electorate and civil society. So do you feel that Switzerland is already fully kind of engaging with civil society and uh, harnessing civil society for health systems reforms? Um, yeah, it, it is a very crucial element in our um, way of how we govern the health system and it has proven to be a very, very um, important one to actually involve the people a bit more and in, in a regular basis. So now the, the, the COVID um, mechanisms, the, the measures we had, the people had to vote three times on those. So we always knew that we had support of a majority of people on the measures we implemented. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Firas Hamza, I'm a digital health uh, transformation expert and a former Microsoft executive. So I've been involved with a lot of projects across uh, healthcare systems in Europe. My question is to you, what are you doing to uh, streamline the process to acquire the new technologies because technology is advancing very quickly, especially in the AI uh, sector. And uh, what are you doing as far as the regulations to start adopting AI? Thank you. Perfect. Unless there is something else here in the room, we'll go back to our panel. Please. Just a question. I'm wondering, um, Isabel, in your opinion, what has been so far the biggest achievement of the European Union in terms of working together for public health? Okay, that's a difficult question there. Uh, so uh, uh, 
let's have one final round, maybe as we started uh, with you, Isabel. A uh, couple of areas about the startups, what the EU is doing in cancer, in research, and so on, which is a lot. That later question, and then perhaps uh, we can get more from you, Vesna, on the whole area of participation. There's been a lot of echo, as you always get when you talk on the subject, and the same for the two other member states, and then we'll go to the final conclusions. Please, Isabel. Well, the biggest Unmarked. achievement uh, in the recent years is uh, everything that we have been doing with the pandemic. For example, the digital certificate, uh, I think that this has been a, a big achievement. The, uh, to be able to, to have the vaccines has been a, a big achievement, uh, I think. Um, well, there could be more, but uh, those the, the biggest. But the, the issue is that uh, all those uh, cooperation, I think that is going down after after the pandemic. So we, we haven't kept the momentum. We, we use the momentum, but uh, we immediate, immediately there are these uh, voices about subsidiarity again. But okay, for the well, um, AI and, and other things, I mean, it's, it's more than health. So I, I haven't mentioned because I am the Ministry of Health in the same way that we are not mentioning here what the ministries of, uh, of uh, finance or agriculture are, are doing. So I, I restrict to my own ministry for, for sure. I mean, DG. Uh, in this case, um, for sure that we are doing in, uh, things on, on other areas, research, uh, education, uh, yes, agriculture, as I have mentioned, employment, etc., that has an, an impact on health and that is supporting some of the activities. For example, the, what was uh, presented yesterday, that was the communication on mental health, and that was a common effort from, from many, many different DGs, uh, and uh, the main one was the DG employment because of the, of the impact. Um, but, uh, but yes, we are investing a lot of uh, cancer. There are two supplementary uh, programs on, in research in the horizon and in the, in the EU for health. The, the pandemic also helped us to, to have more funding and the EU for health that, uh, you know, the previous uh, program was 460 million and now we have 5.3 billion. So that, that is, uh, uh, a lot. And another thing that I, I mean, you were mentioning the, the reform, the DG reform, another thing, um, the fact of um, uh, the European semester and that putting a country specific recommendation uh, that uh, for health, I mean, uh, in 2020 was for the 27. So the 27 member states received country specific recommendation on health. Uh, this year, uh, two weeks ago, only 12 have received spe country specific recommendation. So, but uh, the, 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 for the total uh, amount that uh, has been committed in the recovery plan that uh, is uh, 700 billion, 43 are for health. So this is something we are working, we are, we are improving or we are telling to the member states, even if there is this question of subsidiarity, we cannot enter in health system. We are finding the ways of supporting the member states. You need to reform. If you don't want to reform, you don't receive the money. So uh, sometimes it's, it's, a good, uh, it's a good way. That's important. <laughs> we can bypass subsidiarity and support member states because some member states want that kind of support, which brings me to Vesna, actually, someone who's benefited and is very keen about the support of the EU and working with other member states. But one final conclusion shortly from this uh, last panel. I won't answer this last one, but yes, I agree. It's a good mechanism to push political level uh, to do something. Uh, but I'll go to what I have started before, to social participation. Uh, where does it really is necessary to, to have social participation is in two, uh, two parts. One is when we are making decisions at political level, it's also about political will. And the second is when we are implementing. At political decision level, it's so important uh, to, to have someone, you know, that is pushing politicians to actually go for the values in health. Uh, that is seriously very important, I said before, because of all the other pressures, we have to have strong entities in the society, very vocal. It can be also, you know, organized uh, professionals, health professionals, but it's not their everyday routine. They have to organize themselves in a particular way so they can also contribute, but there are also others, patients and so on. 
On the other hand, when it comes to implementation, you cannot really claim that you are not leaving anybody, nobody behind if you don't really assess the needs of those that are left behind and address those needs appropriately. How can you do this if you don't even know where these people are? The ones that really know where these people are, what their needs are, are those that are working with them. And very often these are civil society organizations. So they can assess their needs and they can also address their needs, but they have to work with the health sector. They cannot do it on their own. And that is what is missing. Thank you. That's absolutely perfect. Thank you very much indeed. From Sweden and Belgium, you want to add anything? And Martin, very, very quickly, because we are running very late. For those in the room and those online, I promise we'll finish only 10 minutes late, which is what we started, uh, our fault as well, but only 10 minutes late. Ingrid, you want to say something very quickly? Uh, very quickly, and it has to do with this, with the Swedish presidency uh, and relates to a couple of other issues that are related to European Union work, and that is uh, a high-level meeting that we performed together with the European Union on, on cancer, prevention of cancer and the cancer plan, where funding comes from, from uh, eu for health so, so, so that's an example of also from our side uh, how we see that we can benefit from international cooperation. And also uh, the other part apart from RMR is that we had a high level meeting on loneliness. It was our new uh, social minister who brought that up. And that has to do with resilience for individuals. Uh, so how, how, and also relates to the upcoming presidency in Spain that might lift mental health. So it, there are so many issues that we could, learn from each other and uh, use evidence to to get forward a mental health indeed is an issue that cuts across directors as you did very well in your new policy and you as a leading in spain uh, pilar your final comments yeah, i was very quick final comments i just want to say a word about uh, because you mentioned the, the financial uh, opportunities at the eu level um, but this is not so easy for national authorities to reach these EU funds. It's complex. There are many, many EU programs with several criteria, and uh, really national authorities need uh, strong skills and strong knowledge to, to access to the EU fund. And that's why Belgium, with, together with Austria and Slovenia, we are for the moment part in a EU project uh, funded by the Commission to try to improve and to ease the access to, to EU funds. And it's in the idea to, to establish an EU resource hub yes. at the, uh, accessible for all the EU member states uh, at the end and try to, to have more use of the EU funds to invest in national health systems. And maybe Jora can put the policy brief that we did for the Slovenian presidency, Dimi Pantelli, actually looking at all the resources and programs, and we are updating that for this uh, work with DG Reform. Martin, the last word. So it's June in Madrid and it's raining. It's 38 Not degrees. anymore. It's 38 degrees in Siberia. People in New York are staying at home because the air is full of the ashes from forest fires in Canada. And we have There's an something international- something positive. And, and, and you, are, you are asking me to be optimistic about the ability of the international community to get its act together. <laughs> it's increasing- Censorship, clear. censorship. Okay, <laughs> that's it. Thank you, Martin. An applause for our wonderful panelists, please. Can you put the slide with the conclusion, the session, please? And uh, I'm inviting Stefan Ekwalder, uh, who is director at the Ministry of Health in Austria, in the areas of finance and health systems. Reinhard Busse over there. Uh, and he is, of course, co-chair of the observatory. I'll ask the others to leave, please, and leave only Pilar, Stefan, and uh, co-chair of the observatory, Stefan, as I said. And then uh, Reinhard Busse, co-director of the observatory as well with Martin McKee and Elias Mosialos, uh, who is also professor at Berlin and is going to be reflecting with us. Uh, uh, we're going to get final reflections from the observatory perspective, from the policymakers' Spanish perspective and from the research perspective, uh, Reinhard Busse. You want to start, Pilar? 
And any things I didn't allow you to say earlier, you can say them now. But only give you three minutes each to make up for my lack of uh, time. No, just very, very short. I think we learned a lot about uh, many things here. I can try to explain. Like uh, we have a lot of ingredients for a nice cocktail because we learn about uh, all of our problems related to health or many solutions, many commitments, many uh, levels of uh, commitments and uh, national government uh, international etc and also how to involve the population uh, probably the solution is how to move these ingredients to try to get the better combination to get the better the better, the, the better solutions this is not easy at all as we said but uh, some uh, sometimes it's uh, good as Vesna and Isabel said that probably uh, it's, it's nice uh, to see the perspective of uh, all the problems we have. It's uh, very important because if no, we don't have the solution. But sometimes it's also necessary, especially to involve the population, to explain population that, uh, because I mean, we all are uh, developed countries, rich countries that give a lot of facilities for the population that, of course, we need to do more, much more, but it's important sometimes to get from this point of view, especially to the strength and the strong measures that we have to develop and to uh, go further. Then probably uh, there are so many main uh, peop uh, clever people here and there are many things of the, you said, I think we can use for this uh, good cocktail we need. That's absolutely perfect. Thank you very much. Do you agree with this cocktail, Stefan? Thank you. Uh, definitely. I think this is what uh, was mentioned so many times now uh, that we, uh, and I think uh, Lisa Maria, you said it also um, typically, or sometimes we take different approaches. I would start with that we all face the same challenges in a way. Um, then sometimes take different approaches, sometimes the same approaches. And if we don't take the same approaches, they converge anyway. So we could be much faster and quicker and avoid mistakes if we if we share them openly. And I think that is another um, area that we that we discussed the, the area of trust that we don't need within this uh, that we also need beyond the system. Uh, to make sure that we learn from each other and can learn from each other. Uh, there was so much uh, said today, uh, and I think the background, uh, and, and that was maybe not not uh, touched upon really because we all um, take it for, for granted, is that we have this assumption and we know that we need a well-functional health and social system as a backbone of our modern society and a democratic society. And and uh, we saw that particularly during during covid uh, what well, we used uh, and also showed that we have the flexibility in reacting. Isabel pointed out that some of the um, success stories, yeah, but I think uh, what we have to uh, reflect upon is that it was firefighting and it was necessary firefighting, but it was not uh, long term sustainability. And if we don't manage now to take what really worked well and uh, transform that into standard care and standard practice, uh, we fail, and and yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if we do that, to be honest, on all levels. So uh, if we if we if we understand that um, uh, we have very a very complex system uh, that is not uh, where it's not uh, possible to uh, just give simple answers, but where it's necessary to to dive in and to look at the evidence and to uh, carry the evidence with you all the time. Uh, in a way, and then uh, 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 rely on it. Then we. Then I'm not sure if we if we take all the all the findings from COVID uh, as serious as we should. And in, in in particular, this is again coming to the questions, or if we if we if we uh, consider that reforms, particularly in the area of health, take endless in a way, yeah, yeah? and sustainable ref reforms. So what uh, what the problem is that we also saw recently that with this uh, eradication of, of trust and maybe using also the pandemic to undermine the trust, we also saw how quickly, on the other hand, yeah. it is possible to undermine the trust and also um, to destroy important elements that uh, assure uh, resilience of our health systems. Mm -hmm. And the other way it doesn't work that quickly. So the other way um, in, in gaining resilience and, and, and making sure our systems perform better, uh, 
they need long-term perspectives. They need a vision. I think we need to involve everyone to make sure that we have the stability and uh, to be able to deliver because that's not nothing that comes from from within Rump presidency from to the other, but that really takes a long breath. And uh, typically, if you want to implement, it's not so much. Obviously, it also is the, the evidence generation. But typically, in the most cases, with primary healthcare, for example, we know what we should do. We just don't know how to do it properly and faster. And I think this is where we have to look at and that's why we need to really also follow a pragmatic approach. So I will not uh, reveal how I voted for also the question on uh, the, the uh, membership, uh, member states versus the European Union. But I think we need to uh, follow both. Yeah, the vision, how do we want the long-term um, relationship and, and, and distribution of competences, but then also this very pragmatic approaches in it's collaborating pragmatic. and making sure we, we can add value uh, where it's easy because we also need these short-term ways of, of, of adding value and showing the relevance of cooperation. That's Thanks. perfect. Perfect messages uh, summarizing what we heard today. Uh, uh, Reinhardt. So from the research perspective, I think we need to go back what Patrick mentioned, for example, to say, okay, what is a good health system? Let's, let's go back to the basics and then say, okay, we have defined it as accessibility, leaving nobody behind, high quality, and, and, and. And then obviously we need to look at which policies, and we need a framework for that, which policies really contribute to achieving which, or hopefully most of these, of of these of these outcomes how can we measure the 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 outcomes so i think we, we we need then a classification this is a this is a policy this is a policy which could which is really bringing us closer and then we are in the area of health system performance assessment and health system performance assessment from this standpoint need both we need this toolbox of policies where we really understand the same. So it, it's also coming back to the framework things. Are we really talking about this, the same thing? When we, even if we say primary care, do we, do, do we really mean, mean the, same, the same things? And then how do we measure the result? If, we ha if, if people who say, I'm a child of evidence-based health policy, as we, are, we all are in the observatory, if we say primary care is the way then okay, is the primary care system really bringing us better access, quality, population health, or or our hospital fans, uh, do they it right? So so we need to come back to the basics. I think what we started with the, with the observatory, much of that is now necessary again to have a good framework and the classification and the classification system, so that we can really based on that then collect the evidence. That's absolutely perfect. And uh, let me finalize a few minutes late, uh, like uh, with uh, uh, an announcement from the sponsor, the observatory. <laughs> and there you are. And I promise I haven't planned that with my concluding people. This is the HSPA framework. <laughs> Jora, put it in the, on, the, on the line, please, if you can, which actually gives you a good framework. Uh, Deepa Rajan is here, who's working on that project. Uh, Anything you wanted to know about the European Health Union, you never dare to ask, Matthias Wismar, our third edition. If you want to know anything about what's going on in Europe and health policy, actually, Isabel de la Mata and colleagues reviewed it. They do not under write it, but uh, reviewed it and they use it, I know. So that's another one. And this is only, uh, the only four of our publications. Obviously, if you want to know the cross country perspective, because resilience work across countries. And if you want to know any country like Spain, happens to be here, it's also in the, in the hits. I have to say thank you very much and my apologies. We ran a bit late, 10 minutes late we started. Thank you for being in the room. I guess you couldn't escape. I hope not many people online have escaped. Uh, it was a very challenging, uh, it was a very challenging seminar because we covered many areas. But that's one of the works of the observatory. We are as interested on the woods as in the trees. We study the trees, but we like to give you a sense of the woods because what we realize, and that's very much your remarks, uh, Reinhardt and you and all of you, people do not understand how these elements come together. And part of our job is to look at these elements. Thank you very much. And I'd like you to give an applause to yourselves for your contributions and for being here for such a long time. Thank you. Thank you.